Our second scripture reading comes to us better from 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Bible is filled with scriptures demonstrating that God keeps his promises to his people. It is also filled with evidence that humanity is not so good at keeping its promises to God. Yet despite the old adage, adage, promises are not meant to be broken. The whole point of promises is to keep them. And today we're going to look at two passages that touch on promises. God's to us and ours to God. The two passages come from books that might not be as familiar to you as most. Daniel is the last major prophet and the only piece of apocalyptic literature and scripture outside of Revelation. Second Peter is one of the newest letters in the New Testament, and a clear example of pseudepigrapha, which is writing attributed to someone other than the author, and in this case it was a way to honor the one whose name was put on the document. Neither of these books is preached on with any regularity by most pastors. In the whole of the Revised Common Lectionary, that three-year rotation of stuff that people preach on, neither Daniel nor 2 Peter appears anywhere. Not once. But 2 Timothy says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. So today, we're going to look at these two books for a word from God on promises. The book of Daniel is found in kind of the middle of the Bible among the Old Testament prophets. He's not necessarily considered a historic recorder of actual events in the life of some guy named Daniel, but the point of scripture is not always to give a detailed historical record of past events or a predictor of future events. Sometimes the purpose is to inspire, strengthen, and encourage God's people in times of distress. The story is real in the most important sense, whether the details can be proven by history or not. God had promised to save his people. And in today's story about Daniel, we see this most miraculous version of God keeping his promises. There are many examples through scripture, from the rainbow with the story of the ark after the flood, to the manna and quail in the wilderness, to the entry into the promised land, to Elijah departing without tasting death, and on and on throughout scripture. God is a maker and keeper of promises, and this story from Daniel is a powerful and picturesque reminder of that fact. The story is set among conflict in the kingdom of Darius, who was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. King Darius had unwittingly caused jealousy among his appointed leaders by favoring Daniel for his good work and strong leadership. In that age-old strategy of name-calling and finger-pointing, a bunch of the other leaders started spreading rumors and plotted against Daniel. But these guys were clever, playing on King Darius's ego by having him issue a rule that said anyone who worshipped or prayed to anything other than the king in the next 30 days would be thrown into a den of lions. 
And as so often happens with rulers, his ego got the best of him, and Darius signed the edict, forgetting in that moment that Daniel was an Israelite who could not pray to or worship anything other than God, and who by necessity worshipped God every day. Then the conspirators spied on Daniel, caught him praying to God, and used the king's edict against him, forcing King Darius to throw Daniel to the lions. And today's passage opens with the king's wish for Daniel's God to rescue him, even as he seals the den with a stone using his own signet ring and that of other officials. Well, when God keeps a promise in a public and miraculous and spectacular way, he makes sure no one can question the veracity of the miracle. The king's seal, along with that of several others, served the same purpose as the guards at Christ's tomb, proving that no one could let the person inside escape with some sort of trickery. And once the den was sealed, King Darius spent the night fasting and not sleeping, obviously displeased at having been tricked into putting his trusted servant in such grave danger. And in the morning, the king went straight away to the lion's den to check on his friend. And as we know, Daniel was alive and well, and proclaimed, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. God had kept his promise of protection in times of danger in a most spectacular manner. And the king happily made sure Daniel was fine and then threw the conspirators to the lions who no longer kept their mouths shut. And the king later issued a decree praising God as the only real God and proclaiming that God's kingdom would last forever. When God proves himself a keeper of promises, even kings come to faith. And when God's people keep their promises, they too can lead people to faith. But God's people aren't always such good promise keepers. From the earliest days of Adam and Eve with a piece of fruit through the drunkenness of Noah and the golden calf in the wilderness all the way up to modern sins, which fortunately we can wash away with the soap that's in the bathroom, we see evidence of that humanity is not really so great at keeping our promises to God. So God sent his only son to make up for all our broken promises. Jesus took the punishment that humanity had or will deserve from the times that we mess up. He paid the debt that was not his as yet another way of God showing that he keeps his promises. God promised to save his people and found a way to keep that promise without contradicting his word about punishing his people who failed to keep their promises to him. Although following God's list of commandments, especially that top ten list, is still the ideal to be strived for, we are no longer condemned when we break them. We no longer live under a system of sacrifice where we have to make prescribed offerings with particular rituals in order to undo the bad that we've done. Instead, we are given freely the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ because of God's goodness and God's generosity and God's keeping of promises. As Peter writes, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. The these that Peter is referring to are everything needed for life and for godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And these come from God's divine power, not through our own works. So God helps us keep our promises by giving gifts he gave in keeping his own promises. And then even our own limited ability to keep our promises to God is a result of God's own perfect promise keeping. Now why in the world would God do such a thing? Why would God keep his promises when we break ours again and again and again? Why would he even sacrifice Jesus for us? The answer is because he loves us 
It really is as simple as that. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us and wants to protect us, even from ourselves, from the trouble that we will most certainly find if left to our own devices, and the trouble that will find us even when we're trying to be good. Like any loving parent, God gives us rules and guidance and boundaries, advice and reminders. And every once in a while, even patiently, explains the rules and guidance and advice and reminders and the motivation for them as he does through his servant Peter in today's passage. Peter writes, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. That's why the rules are what they are. The guidance is given as it is. The advice that we struggle to follow is repeated over and over. It's to remind us of what's expected of us. My mother used to say that we had to practice good manners at home so that we would be welcome when we went other places. It was for our own benefit so we would have the knowledge and practice we needed to succeed in the social world so far as she was able to help. We weren't always very good about practicing, especially when we were at home, but she taught us anyway. God's motivation, written here in 2 Peter, is similar. God wants us to be the very best we can be, following his rules and advice so that we can be welcome in something far more important than social situations. We can be welcomed into the divine nature in heaven. God's rules for us exist so that when our time comes and we go to heaven and see God face to face, we will fit in seamlessly with his own divine nature, easily becoming part of the heavenly realm. We need to learn here and now to fit into the divine nature in heaven, and just like with my mom in the manner she tried so hard to instill in her rather unruly children, we have to practice to get good at doing what we are supposed to do. Practicing isn't always fun. Ask any top-notch athlete or artist or writer or person with any kind of skill, and you are likely to find it truly is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. But practice tends to be the only thing that makes us even close to perfect. So we have to practice. We have to practice keeping our promises made in baptism to follow Jesus the best we can. Peter tells us what to practice, too. It's very helpful. Peter gives good instructions. Step by step, he says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Pile all that stuff on, and you'll get the benefit of the practice. Now what is the penalty for not practicing? Peter tells us that as well. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So when we practice, we become more productive in our knowledge of Jesus. And I would dare say in our work on his behalf. And when we don't practice, we not only fail to keep our promises, but we kind of forget that God has always kept his. We become not just unruly children, but ungrateful ones as well, an embarrassment to our Heavenly Father and to ourselves, shaming the name of Christ, the very one who, by keeping his own promises, took the punishment that we get to live instead of dying. And Peter ends with this admonition. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we do these things, if we add faith to goodness and add to the goodness knowledge and knowledge self-control and to the self-control perseverance and to the perseverance godliness and to the godliness mutual affection and to the mutual affection love, then we will be ready to be welcomed into the divine nature, the holy and heavenly kingdom of God, seamlessly and without shame, 
making our Heavenly Father proud and making all those promises he kept, all those lessons he taught, all the efforts he made on our behalf, worth it. God keeps his promises. Daniel's story bears testimony to this. And we should keep ours as well. And Peter's lesson tells us how to do so, step by step. All so that we can be welcomed into God's heavenly kingdom to become part of God's divine nature. Amen.